Welcome to The Wall of Soundtrack, a show where we discuss the music and soundtracks behind the very best TV shows and motion pictures. In this episode, we analyze and dissect the music and soundtrack behind William Friedkin's basketball drama, Blue Chips. Hey guys, just a quick announcement. I recently released a new episode of the Brewtune podcast where I pair 311 with their signature beer, the Rock Brothers 311 Amber Ale. So if you're a fan of 311 and Rock Brothers beers, be sure to check this episode out. Blue Chips is a basketball drama film that was released in 1994. The film was directed by William Friedkin and written by Ron Shelton. The story surrounds Western University head basketball coach Pete Bell, who is struggling to keep his team competitive in the NCAA, but is ultimately forced to bend the rules. Blue Chips also had a renowned cast of actors and actresses, including the following. Nick Nolte as Coach Pete Bell. Mary McDonnell as Pete's ex-wife, Jenny Bell. J.T. Walsh as Happy Kuykendall. Ed O'Neill as reporter Ed. Alfre Woodward as Butch's mom, LaVonda McRae. NBA Hall of Famer Bob Cousy as Athletic Director Vic Roker. Basketball Pro Matt Nover as Ricky Rowe. NBA Pro Shaquille O'Neal as Neon Badeau. NBA Pro Anthony Penny Hardaway as Butch McRae. Robert Wool as Sports Agent Marty. And Louis Gassat Jr. as Father Dawkins. The film also had a variety of cameos from well-known players and head coaches, including the following NBA Hall of Famer Larry Bird and NBA Pro Calbert Chaney and NCAA head coaches Bobby Knight and Rick Pitino. My returning guest for this discussion is Cy Shackelford. Cy is a writer for the entertainment commentary and review website Action Agogo. You can follow his articles on the website www.actionagogo.com and you can also follow him on Twitter. His Twitter handle is at Shaq underscore house 83. As always, Cy and I had a blast on this episode and we thought what better time than now since March Madness is on the horizon to discuss such a great basketball film. Here's my discussion with Cy on the music and soundtrack behind William Friedkin's epic college basketball film, Blue Chips. All right, Cy, nice to see you again. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So what's new with Action to Go-Go? Um, what are we doing now? We're, this is a this is a big two months for us, March and April, because of all the Marvel films that are coming out. And if you haven't heard as of yesterday, they rehired Disney rehired James Gunn back as director of Guardians of the Galaxy Part Three. Yeah, they 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 got rid of him for some tweets he made over a decade ago that just showed how dark humor he was. But it's like it's over a decade ago, and he's had. He's been progressive since then. It's like, why'd you get rid of him to cave into social justice warriors on 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 social media? Yeah, and it's, you always have to be so careful about what you say on Twitter because everyone will just use that against you. Yeah, like even even me today. What's it called? I, I'm I'm in Facebook jail right now for the next twenty four hours. What happened? Uh, some some idiot that I was arguing in a hip hop group about. He wouldn't accept being proven wrong. So I just went in on him, and apparently he got offended. Enough to let me know, like, two seconds later, Face was like, do you win against our community standards? I'm like, what the hell did I do? Yeah, I, I just, I try to stay off of it, like, and only go on to, like, when I need to on Twitter or Facebook. Because you can get into arguments and it's like, you realize it's taking up all your time, like, typing up these responses. It's like another job. Yeah, I remember seeing a meme. Uh, they weren't called memes back then, back in 2004. <laughs> Somebody wrote. It was a picture with a caption on it. Being arguing on the internet is like being in the Special Olympics. Even if you win, you're still retarded. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, did you did you see the trailer for Avengers Endgame? And, yeah, the second trailer. This one is like okay, this is sick. And they even got a new poster for it too of everybody who's left behind after Infinity War. I didn't know Paul Rudd was actually a character in that series. Yeah, he's Ant Man. He debuted in the Ant Man movie back in 2015. They have so many like high profile actors now in that franchise. They do, they do. It's like if you want to like get, get a good payday and whatnot, and, and get a critical acclaimed film, go to Marvel Studios. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you, I. I feel like you'll always have a job, right? Because like, there's so many movies, and the franchise is so popular. Except for Terrence Howard, he wouldn't keep his mouth shut after the first Iron Man film. Yeah. That's why he got replaced by uh, Don Cheadle. 
Okay. All right. So, you know, we're in the midst of March Madness coming up now. Lots of college basketball. And we have one of my favorite movies we're going to talk about, Blue Chips. It's good timing. Good timing for it as well, too. And I know you're a UConn fan. How is the team? I haven't been following. How, how are they doing this year? Well, we're not in March Madness is what I understand. And um, the the women, they're always going they're always going to be pushing ahead going forward. The men, if they had a Calhoun or a Kevin Ali, they'd be on top again. Okay, gotcha. I'm um I'm a Florida fan and they're doing okay, but they actually won last night. They beat LSU. Mm. But um, you know, my girlfriend's a, a Tennessee fan. She's a Volunteers fan. So I guess by default I'm a I'm a Tennessee fan, but they're doing very well. Hey, that's good, that's good. I, I will say this. At least none of us, including your girlfriend, are Duke fans. <laughs> yeah. They're they're the devil. It's right there in their mask in their name. Yeah. Are you now if they're playing North Carolina, who are you rooting for? Are you are you rooting for Duke or North Carolina? North Carolina. Now my father, he's from North Carolina and as are all of his family. So when we go down there during March Madness sometimes, sometimes so I, one of my uncles is a Duke fan and the cousin I stay with, he wavers back and forth. Back in two thousand seven I remember his motto during March Madness was A B C anybody but Carolina. <laughs> and Mike Shiseski, I mean like guys like I mean, he's been around for so long. Very long. And he just keeps winning. I mean, he just keeps... He's like, like, like Bobby Knight. Yeah, yeah. Or like, you know, your favorite player, Tom Brady from the NFL. It's like, how long is he going to stay around? But, uh, they yeah, just keep love doing They love doing it. I mean, what's it called? Brady, he says he's going to stay around until he's 45. And at the current pace he's on, I believe him. <laughs> yeah. So um, this movie, man, I love it. I feel like it's such an accurate portrayal of you know the issues surrounding compensation of college athletes i just feel like it's so true it's kind of like the program or like he got game as well by spike lee that came out four years after this yeah yeah i just i love this movie and it kind of brings me back every time i watch it brings me back uh to when i was you know really young back in 1995 watching this movie and playing basketball and you see all like your 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 role models like shaquille o'neal and anthony Penny hardaway Hard yeah. yeah yeah it's awesome man and um, it's just a great film. I mean, Nick Nolte is a phenomenal actor. He's fun to watch. I mean, that 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 that, that voice he has too is unmistakably his. Is like he's one of the most recognizable voices in Hollywood. And he, uh, I think he's mastered the craft of of getting angry and screaming. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's 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 very 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 good at that. He is. A lot of his movies, like the first two Forty Eight Hours movies, this one, oh my goodness, Thin Red Line, man, Thin Red Line, yeah. Yeah, when he's telling the guy to charge up the hill. <laughs> I forget his name, that actor, but he man, he just like, I think he, he cusses about 50 times and <laughs> his favorite cuss word is God damn it. You know? No, God damn it, it's got to be the goddamn damn man. <laughs> and he definitely does a lot of screaming in the movie as well. Yeah, like what's it called? He's like, I, I think he studied some of the some of the college basketball coaches, how they act during during the games. So some of them are that intense where they're, they're wearing suits and they're sweating right through their suits. Yeah. and whatnot and like yelling at the rest but, but the opening the scene the opening game in the film right the, that's what i remember most from seeing the trailer when i was a kid when he took the ball from the ref and just soccer kicked it to the audience did you know that nick nolte was actually a punter in in like high school he played football oh, I, I didn't know that nah <laughs> and i was like damn man because he kicked that ball he looked like an nfl punter man Yeah, he wasn't he was like 50 at the time too Oh, that scene's so hilarious, and that's like one of the, I think the most iconic scenes. It is because uh, you know they have the the press conference afterwards, and and uh, the uh, I think it was it was Ed O'Neill or it was another another reporter. He goes, um, Coach Bell, would you like to comment on the basketball punting incident? And, and he's, he's like, like <laughs> he's like he's like uh, basketball punting incident. Okay, thank you. Next question. You just use up all your questions, moron. Yeah, yeah. He pulled a Donald Trump on him. <laughs> he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> and another another parallel to this film was what's it called? Um, years later, the Queens rapper slash chef Action Bronson, he made a mixtape that was patterned with the cover was based off the off the iconic poster of Blue Chips with Nick Nolte yelling at the ref. Yeah, yeah. Bronson just like put himself in in, in Nick Nolte's place, a drawing of himself with his great big beard and his girth. They even called the mixtape Blue Chips. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It definitely left an impact on me, this film. Um, the cast was incredible. I mean, you have Nick Nolte, then you have J.T. Walsh. R.I.P. You know, he was an incredible actor. He was in Nixon and, you know. Um, uh, a Few Good Men, Outbreak. Yeah. He was in a lot of good films. Yeah. And he was just phenomenal playing Happy, you know, yeah, the he sleazeball was, he was. character. We own you, Pete. We own your team. Yeah, yeah. And then... Um, Mary McDonald. 
Mary McDonald. And then you have all these the NBA uh, stars like Shaquille O'Neal, Anthony Hardaway. Uh, oh, what's it called? Larry Bird. You know, Bob Cousy, I think, plays the athletic director. He's, Vic, yeah. Dick Vitale. Yeah, Dick Vitale. Bobby Knight. Oh, yeah. Rick Pitino. They oh, my God. People. That guy. Rick Pitino. What happened to that guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened doesn't even cover it. Did you hear what he did in the back of that, like, that restaurant? He he brought, like, women in the back of the restaurant. <laughs> he was, like, having sex with the women in the, in the back of the restaurant. Had had a guy cover for him and, like, lock off, like, the like, whole front of the restaurant. It's, it's like, like, the, it's like, it's like the, the, what's it called, the Humpty Hump line. I once got busy in the Burger King bathroom. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, man? Like... It's like there had to be alcohol involved in that decision. Had to be because like, nobody, nobody sober will do that. Yeah, yeah, just crazy. Even but. on a, even on a dare. And then, uh, then the film is directed by William Friedkin, which uh, he's the, he's awesome, man. I mean, he was known for The Exorcist, The French Connection, uh, To Live and Die in Los Angeles. Yeah, I haven't seen that movie yet. I heard it's really good. Living like uh, you, I found a Blu-ray for it in a Seven Eleven a few years back. Yeah, Willem Dafoe and uh, William Peterson, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check that one out. But and then the soundtrack is pretty pretty iconic as well. You know, you got all these uh, classic rock, you know, songs and blues songs. And and you think because it was '94 and taking place on a college campus, you think they have a lot of like indie rock in there, like Sonic Youth or something like that that was big at the time. Yeah, or Four Non Blondes or something or Fish, but nah. It's not even like that at all. You just, you just use classic rock songs, no new songs. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, we'll, we'll jump into our first one here by John Mellencamp, Baby, Please Don't Go. And this is um, this is a cover song. I did, um, Joe, I think it was Joe, um, Joe Williams did the song originally. But it's I, I was doing some research on this, and apparently it's like one of the most redone and covered blues songs. Really? Yeah. And um, it's got a recognizable riff. Yeah. Yeah, it has that in that that intro riff when you hear it, it, it kind of builds up the suspense because it, it it always sounds like to me when I hear it, I'm like, oh, like something's something's going on, you something know, like, go down. Yeah. yeah, something's going on. There's there's some mystery in the air. But um, yeah, I, I really like this song a lot and it really works well with the like plot of the movie. And and the one scene that you mentioned, too, where uh, where Slick, he, Pete meets his old friend Slick, and Slick has a player for him that turns out to be Shaquille O'Neal. Neon Budo is his name, right? Yeah. And um, what's it called? He tells him, we got to go. You want to take a plane ride? To where? Algiers. Algiers! <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. And then they're running through the uh, like the, like the swamp or whatever, and he's all like, pit- Nick Nick Nolte's all pissed off at yeah. Slick. He's like, he's like, you're never coming back to another game. God damn it. Because <laughs> like, he's got dirt all over his shirt. Yeah, but that changed, he changed his mind when he sees Neon play. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely worth the trip. But um, yeah, when when the, in, and even in that scene, I don't know if you heard it. There's like the Van Morrison version of that song is uh, played in the in the beginning. Well, I didn't catch it, nah. Yeah, it's a diff- it's a it's a different song. Um, it's Van Morrison Morrison's version of the song, but um, you hear John Mellencamp's version of it in the beginning of the film. And then at the end of it as well, the you, ending montage. You hear the whole song, yeah, with the vocals and everything. Because before that, you were just hearing what's it called the um the the more familiar guitar riff. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, it's definitely. I think it's a great cover. And Mellencamp, you know, he's he's pretty iconic. I feel like was pretty popular as a solo artist from what the late eighties, A- eighties and early nineties. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the uh, the lyric the lyrics do go well with the with the plot. You, you know, baby, please don't go down to New Orleans. You know, I love you so, and yeah. I feel like it goes with well with the like the epilogue. Yeah, yeah, and then the theme of the movie. I mean, I feel like the whole time, the whole time, don't yield to temptation. Yeah, yeah, it's please, baby, please don't go cheating. I guess you know that's another thing. You know, that's yeah. the temptation to pay pay athletes to 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 win. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I was watching the end of the movie um, last night and in the locker room scene, like when he's talking to his players and saying that, you know, hey, we we, we did something wrong. Yeah. We cheated. And he's like, I can't win like this. I thought it was really cool how the director put a like um, he put like a poster in the back, like on top of mm-hmm. of the um, drawing board, like the whiteboard. And it yeah. said, don't complicate winning. <laughs> yeah, that, that was very. That was intended some symbolism. Yeah, and I feel like that's what this movie is about, right? <laughs> complicated, <laughs> complicated winning. Yeah, I yeah. Mean. So um, then we'll go to our next song by Creedence Clearwater, Clearwater Revival. Yeah, 
And I got I got a, I gave each one of their CDs at home. I remember my first time I heard them was in that uh that B movie that came out in eighty nine, the sequel to West Craven Swamp Thing. It was called Return of the Swamp Thing. And they use the Creedence Clearwater revival song Born on a Bayou in the opening credits and the ending credits. Yeah, and, and this song goes so well with that with the scene that it's used in. They're going down to Indiana. 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 You know, French Lick, Indiana. French Lick, yeah. To meet uh to meet Larry Bird. Or actually Ricky Rowe, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Pete's going to meet Larry Bird to connect him with. Oh, yeah, sure, sure goes, yeah, because Larry Bird, he's from French Lick. Yeah. So he she literally shows up on, uh, you know, Larry, oh. Larry Bird's backyard. You know, <laughs> like he shows up and Larry Bird's playing basketball and you hear the song. And uh, he, he, Larry Bird just picks up on Pete's bullshit. Like he immediately. does instantly, yeah. He's like, what do you want? Like, why, why are you here? You didn't come here for no social call. Yeah, and yeah, I feel like the the lyrics work so well with this with this uh, song and the scene as well. Um, you look here, giant giant doing cartwheels, st- statue wearing high heels. Look at the happy creatures dancing on the lawn, and I feel like you know Pete's doing his song and dance to Larry. Pretty, pretty much, yeah, and like like you said, the lyrics work well because it is a country bluegrass song. But the funny thing is, all of Creedence Clearwater they're from the San Francisco Bay Area. They sound like they're from like the Louisiana swamps. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it, it just fits in so well with the world the rural backdrop of like, you know, Indiana and then they go to see uh they go to see Ricky on the farm. Yeah, and, that, and that's where it fits even more so more so, yeah. Yeah. And then we have our next song by Slim Harpo, Shake Your Hips. Um this one is used <laughs> when <laughs> when see Happy. Yeah, Happy walks in and um he starts talking to Pete and he's like Yo, you're angry. You're angry. You you coach better when you're angry, and he just starts talking a lot of shit. Like, yeah, he does. And uh, he gets up and leaves. He walks in with the two broads. <laughs> oh yeah, Karen and some another name I forget what. Two blondes. Clearly, they had boob jobs. Yeah, yeah. You could tell Happy has ha- has a lot of money, and he's very happy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You can tell that too. Because what's it called when um when he asks, he's like, "Why are you so? Why are you always so pissed off whenever you see me?" Because you and the 50 alumni, you represent are all obnoxious slobs. <laughs> yeah, and then he starts, like, talking more shit and goading him. And... Goading him, yeah, but he offered him, like, a way to help his team win. Yeah. Saying, my, my money's untraceable, unwashable, rinsed, etc. Yeah, and he's making that whole argument, you know, and it's, and it's an ongoing debate in college athletics. Of, Everybody's you know, doing it, so so who cares? Or, you know, whether to pay players or not. And, I mean, it's... It's, it's a, a, it's still illegal though. I mean, yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be done um, based well, on the rules. But basically. some people can make arguments, and he he does. He makes that argument that you know we owe it to him, right? That's yeah, what we he owe says. it to them. Yeah, because what's it called? The school get rich gets rich off them, gets rich off their jerseys and whatnot. But the players don't get nothing, and that that is true. Yeah, I mean, they, I feel like they have to find something in the middle. You know, find some sort of stipend that they could give them. Yes, yeah, something, Because yeah. the college does make all this money off of athletes. They make, you know, for the jerseys, the merchandise, video games. They make tons of money off them, yeah. And, like, what's it called? And at the end of it, they get out with a degree, most likely, but there's no guarantee that they'll play pro. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times they can't make class, so it's hard to actually do well because you're – some of them can. Like when I was in school, Emeka Okafor, he was a senior when I was a junior, right? And his like GPA was like three point six, and he still went pro. Wow, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, it is because it's definitely it's definitely hard difficult. to be a student athlete. Or he, Richard Sherman, he from the from the San Francisco Forty ers formerly the Seahawks. Yeah, he was a, he was a scholar athlete as well too. Oh, yeah. Did he go to Stanford? He went to Stanford. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. He um. Who's he? Is he playing for San Francisco now? He is, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, all I remember is when he was on the Seahawks and he was he, talking a lot of smack. Yeah, that, that that one that one thing that made him famous after the San Francisco Seattle playoff game that led to Super Bowl 40, uh, 48. Yeah, where, where people called him a thug after that rant he made. I'm like, he's just talking shit, basically. That's what football players do. Yeah, yeah, lots so, of lots of shit talking. Jalen Ramsey's guilty of that too. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. All football players are guilty of it. But if you can back it up, it's it's not arrogance or shit talking. Yeah, Muhammad Ali did that best. Yeah, he definitely did. Um, and also when you you go back to this song and look at the lyrics, it works. The lyrics really um, illuminate like the themes, like points that uh, you know that Happy's trying to make about the paying the athletes and. You know, he essentially the lyrics say, I want to tell you about a dance that's going around everybody doing it from the grown ups down. 
Yeah, it's like, what's it called? He's saying that everybody's doing it in college, so you should join in too. It's like, you're not going to get caught. It's a temptation. Yeah. But And he wouldn't have got caught, but he had a crisis of conscience. Yeah. I think he, you know, he let his pride too get the best of him, I feel like. He would. He wanted to win the right way. Yeah. So then we go to our next song by John Lee Hooker, I Need Some Money. I love this song. Me too. It's so perfectly placed and... And there's not many lyrics, but you you know what this song's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's played during the montage when when um you know all of the different like payoffs are being delivered to each of the athletes. And like, he, and he goes to Happy's Mansion first. Like, tell me what I got to do. You need to know how it works. Just know that we're going to take care of you. The friends of the um program. Friends of the program. Yeah. He's like he's like how does it work? He's like you don't want to know how it works. <laughs> right. Well, he's right. He's right. You don't want to know. I love how he like he walks out and he's wearing like his like like happy walks out and he's wearing his like tennis yeah like, like, is. tennis gear on and he's got the the tube socks on that are like pulled way up way and, up yeah and the girls going upstairs later yeah and he's got he's got his beer gut like dude I'm like I wish I was super rich too like that then I could afford not to have a care in the world yeah yeah don't we all the uh, J T Walsh man I just he's a phenomenal actor he was fun to watch I remember, the last thing I remember I remember watching him in recently was a few good men. Yeah, when he plays Markinson. Yeah, he plays Markinson, yeah. And then he, like, you know, randomly shows up in the back of Tom Cruise's car. Yeah, it's like, what's it called? It's like, you got a lot of creep to you, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's a, uh, but he he definitely, he he did a great job. And he was awesome in Nixon, too. He played, he uh, played Ehrlichman. And... Even the bit part he had an outbreak where he tried to convince everybody about the bomb they're about to drop. It's like the five minute part he had in there. It's like, damn. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, on, I'm like, I wanted to see you up against Hoffman or Donald Sutherland or Morgan Freeman or one of them have scenes with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, man, I haven't. That's another movie that came out around this time, too. Like came out I, a year later, 95. Yeah. 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 That was a good time for movies. I feel like there's a lot of good movies that came out. 90s were a fun time for movies. A lot of these, uh, some of the ones that we talked about, like Casino. Remember, I remember during this time, that was one of the films I snuck in at a city place when I was 12. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Jurassic Park too. Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park Part Two. Oh no, Jurassic Park is. I was saying Jurassic Park as well. Came oh. out the first one in nineteen ninety five. Ninety three or ninety three. Sorry. Yeah, I saw, I saw. I remember seeing that in the theater at Wheaton Wheaton Plaza theaters in Wheaton, Maryland. Yeah, I saw that movie like so many times in the theater. I feel like I I know every single line from that movie practically. Me too. The movie was dope. It's like I saw it twice in the theater. It's like the special effects were ill, and it's like, but the the plot, the science. That I understood, but then the symbolism being that it's a Steven Spielberg film, I didn't really start seeing all that until after I bought it on Blu-ray when it came out. Gotcha. And I was like, okay, yeah, Spielberg was a master storyteller. Yeah, and I love the the Muldoon in that movie, man. Robert Muldoon was my favorite character. Clever Ult- girl. Ultimate badass. Yeah, when he realizes she got the Raptors with the drop on him. Clever girl. Yeah. <laughs> like, respected the enemy. <laughs> I wish they had brought him back in the second movie, but, you know. He was good. Yeah. But um yeah this this song man it's 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 really great um it's a great little montage and they uh they they show up on Ricky's door with the the tractor the and, tractor and the bag of money that he wanted yeah and then neon they show up with the Lexus remember he's like I didn't want this I don't want this yeah and he's like he's like hey man I just delivered Liber- these I don't know nothing right very <laughs> dude Shaq was so good in this movie man he was he was funny in this movie I mean what's it called I when he um Pete walks in the room. He's like, she's your ex-wife? Yeah, I see why you divorced a bitch. And she didn't get offended. <laughs> yeah, she just she, rolled with it. She didn't care. Mm-hmm. Man, I swear, Shaquille O'Neal, that guy's been in, like, he's on commercials. Like, he's, like, he was, like, he did his own, like, wasn't he, like, released a, a hip-hop, hip-hop album? album at the time, yeah, the time this came out, yeah. Yeah, it's just crazy, man. The guy's, like, on, he's still out there. Like, I mean, it's like, dude, you're retired. You can, like, you've made a lot of money. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to do nothing. You got movies, you had an album, and you played for six teams during your 19-year career. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the guy is just, I mean, he'll definitely be in the NBA Hall, Hall of Fame for sure. Oh, most I mean, definitely, most definitely. I mean, he was like, he was playing with Kobe, right? Like on the Lakers? Lakers, he played for the Lakers the longest, more more than any of the teams he's ever played for. Okay, gotcha, yeah. And then, um, then didn't Penny Hardaway play on the Magic? Orlando Magic? Yeah, Magic? Yeah, he was there too. They both were there at the same time this movie came out. Yeah, that's crazy. It is, it is. And then I like how the film alludes to their... Uh, it's like meta commentary on their futures in the epilogue, saying um, Butch and uh, Neon they dropped out of college and now play for the NBA. Of course, the guys who play them play for the NBA too. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I I, I like how it like all kind of like worked well with the the current events and chronology, like you know chronology, of, like their careers. <laughs> it did, yeah. And and um, what's it called? The um, what was it? 
The epilogue, it reminds me of something that happened on any given Sunday, which we also covered, where after Nick Nolte's character quits the college basketball team and decides to coach high school basketball instead and still and still fighting with the refs, as they say. Yeah. It reminds me of what uh, Jim Brown's character was saying in any given Sunday. It's like, when I'm done with this. I want to coach high school. The game's pure. Kids just want to play. Yeah. Yeah. No money involved. Yeah. Another great film, man. I love that movie. We um, made you. We made the playbook simple because you're dumb. Yeah, that reminds me of that scene where, uh, you know, I think it's the first scene in, in Blue Chips where he walks and he's like, "You guys shouldn't be playing with jerseys. You should be playing with jock straps." <laughs> you're the dumbest team I ever coached. <laughs> he takes the water bottle, and just throws it. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, "I'm sick of fighting you, sons of bitches. <laughs> I, I want to win so bad I can fucking touch it." <laughs> Nick Nolte, man. Yeah. I like it when he dr- – there's another game where I think before it, he comes in and gives the, pr- the pregame talk and he draws a he draws a heart on a the heart, whiteboard. Yeah. He goes, you know what this is? A heart. He's like, yes, that's right. It's a goddamn heart. I'm starting to think there's some intelligence in this room. <laughs> yes. Dude, he, he, uh, Nick Nolte did such a phenomenal job. And I was reading up on, on his like his prep for this movie. And I think he had shadowed Bobby Knight. Yeah, I believe that based on how he was acting out out on the out on the court and whatnot, the way he was shot at the rest. Like, yeah, this is what the most intense basketball co- NCAA basketball coaches do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he, I think he nailed it. I mean, he did. It was fun to watch. Yeah. And um, actually, Bobby Knight's in the film, too, in the last game. In the last game, he's the coach. Yeah. Dude, that guy is like. He's that guy is so intense, man. Like you see his face during like when he's when he's when he called a timeout and he's meeting with this team, like his face is like apple red. Apple red, yes. It looked like he's either like extremely pissed, which he probably was, or he's extremely sunburnt. <laughs> oh, we're just excited. All that all that all that gets him. That's his cardio. A, fo- a basketball game, yelling from the sidelines, that's his cardio for the whole day. Yeah, exactly. So we uh we go to our next song by Al Green, Let's Stay Together. It's the scene where um, Pete and and his wife um, Jenny they go, you know, on a date and I, to this restaurant. And I guess there's some kids that are coming up, and he's one, signing autographs. An autograph, yeah, yeah. And she makes a sly remark about how just a couple of divorcees going out. Yeah, and uh, I think the song works perfectly because Pete, you know, he says he's crazy about. He loves his ex-wife. He yeah. does. Yeah, I mean, you see it throughout the movie when he tries to stay over after they lose the first game. Yeah, she stiff arms him. Yeah, she teases him a little bit. She stiff arms him like, what's it called? You're impossible to live with. Yeah, yeah. But um, it, this works so well, and he tells her he's crazy about about her. And then Al Green, he's he's like like uh, what R and B R and B soul singer. Yeah, yeah. So um, and it it just I think really captures the vibe well. And then you hear the the, the lyrics. I'm I'm so in love with you. Whatever you want want to do. It's all right with me because you make me feel so brand new. All I want to do is spend my life with you. Oh, yeah. it's. I've heard this song in multiple movies before, like Higher Learning back in 90, which was a year after this, actually. Yeah, I think that's where I first heard it when Ice Cube and Busta Rhymes play this song and it pisses off Michael Rappaport's character. <laughs> what happened to that guy, man? I feel like the last movie I saw him in was what? True. Uh, was he in True Romance? Yeah, he was True Romance, yeah, but he, that He's been was in some other films too, right? True Romance, Metro, Higher Learning, Bamboozled, Copland. Okay. Um, what's it called? But now he's like he's heavy into sports, so you see him on ESPN a lot, or you see him on his Facebook page doing like a self video where he curses out Donald Trump oh, or, yeah. so, or or when he or he really wants to get his uh, his New York blackness on or whatever. <laughs> he starts cursing out some rappers and make dumb decisions. I got a cousin <laughs> that knows him too, actually. He says Mike, he's the blackest white man I ever met. <laughs> I, I think he has his own podcast too, which is pretty mm. entertaining to listen to. Is it called "I'm Not Rappaport"? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. the Woody Allen movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was um, he had a small character in True Romance, but uh, Dick Ritchie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Clarence, you coming to come see me, man? Well, that's such an epic movie, man. It is. It is. It's 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 a teenage boy's fantasy. That's what it is. <laughs> Quentin it, Tarantino, man. It is like a, a girl that that falls in love with you, guns, coke, money, and what's it called? And uh, and that one take scene with Christopher Walken and Dennis Hopper. Oh yeah, the epic Sicilian scene. scene. Yeah, the Sicilian scene, and then oh man, there's so many good actors in that, like Tom Sizemore. You know, Gar- uh, Gary Oldman, Drexel. Oh man, that's like one of the roles. I think his most iconic roles. Yeah, it wasn't called. It's like okay. After that, I was convinced. Like okay, if you, you had me thinking that you were a black man in that movie, even though you clearly are just a white man who thinks he's black. But still, it's like <laughs> you could play my mother, and I would be convinced. 
Yeah, I mean, it really demonstrates his range as an actor. It does. And the thing of it is, is like I've seen the interviews that they had for True Romance, like the behind the scenes interviews where they talk to him while he's still dressed up as Drexel, but he's not acting in character at all. Okay. He's talking in his regular British accent. It's like, okay, okay, you're a chameleon. You ain't no method actor, but you're a chameleon. And the guy has been in so many movies. I mean, he was in JFK. He was in... Uh, Sid and Nancy, State of Grace. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? Hannibal. He was uncredited for that. Fifth Element. You remember Wait, Fifth, Fifth Element? Fifth Element, yeah. Um, the Professional, yeah. Air Force One, Air and, Force. The Dark, and the Batman Dark Knight trilogy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he... I, did he? I think he finally won an Academy Award, right? For like, Churchill? I think. The Winston Churchill movie where he played Churchill. Yeah. I mean, and, and that was way overdue. I it mean, was overdue, yeah. I mean, he got an Oscar nomination before that for Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. But even then, it was like he should have got something long before that, a nomination or something. Yeah. And I mean, I think his portrayal as Oswald like, was, was incredible because there's not much on Oswald. I mean, like you don't have much to work with. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he made that character come to life and, you know, made it like very believable. He calls it big acting is what he calls it. Because I remember in State of Grace where he plays Jackie Flannery, uh, Irish hood from Hell's Kitchen. You see him in scenes with Sean Penn and Ed Harris. It's like, okay, those guys are already established heavyweights, but you, you stole the show. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely an incredible actor. Um, so let's go to our next song. It's Jimi Hendrix, All Along the Watchtower. This is another incredible song and really well placed i feel like it captures that scene where pete discovers that tony's been shaving points oh yeah so he, he goes through the tape and then he he runs over to uh tony's, tony's dorm where they're having a party and whatnot yeah, yeah the song's playing in the background um and you know works perfectly because it's a very it's a very trippy song it is the way hendrix the hendrix's version was trippy that's the most well-known version i mean bob dylan had the original yeah. And I think I've only heard that version in um the 1999 Kevin Spacey film American Beauty. Okay. Okay. And not to mention you were just drinking an Abita Purple Haze uh lager there. Purple Haze raspberry yeah. lager. Yeah. So uh that's good timing, right? Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. And this and it, and the song does go perfectly with the with the scene itself. It's like He's been, th I mean, Pete's been thrown on a loop after being, after watching the tape and rewinding it and being convinced that what Happy told him was true about Tony being involved in a point shaving scheme. It just throws his whole world in a loop. It's like, oh, at first I thought cheating, me cheating by getting these players, it was bad enough. Now I found out one of my favorites. He actually really did cheat. Yeah. Yeah. And the lyrics, like there must be some kind of way out of here. Yeah. Like Pete in his mind is trying to figure out how the hell do I get out of this mess? Yeah. He messed that He created really. Yeah, and then the the when that's the end of that scene, you hear that really iconic Jimi Hendrix like effect that he has, um, that he uses on his guitar, and it's like it's really trippy, man. It's it like is. you feel like you're in like listening to like almost like a Pink Floyd song, you know? <laughs> yes, it does, it does. And this song has worked well in multiple movies, like Forrest Gump during the Vietnam scene, yeah, Watchmen during the, the Mars scene, and I think. And looking back on it, that's the one song that did fit in the movie for Watchmen all along the Watchtower. Yeah, yeah. The title. <laughs> the title, the title anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, an awesome song. And then I believe, you know, we go to... And finally... Uh, it, 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 a couple of pieces done by Niall Rogers, who's a very, very, very uh, I well-known uh, well musician, three-time Grammy winner. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, he, I think he did a couple of other scores for, um, I think Spike Lee was one of them. For which ones by Spike Lee? Um, I remember Terrence Blanchard did a lot of his scores, but Nile Rogers, I can't recall which one. I'm blanking on the film. I'm blanking on the film that he scored for Spike Lee, but I was, um, I thought I came across that when my research, but I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it. But yeah, he's done a lot of work for. Um, He's done a lot of score work. Um, he's won three Grammys, and and I think he did so for with these, you know, three pieces. It was Butch's Chicago Blues, which you know is essentially um, a piece that's used when Pete Pete Bell goes to visit Butch in Chicago and in inner city. They always have like a blues uh, a blues riff or a blues song playing when they go to inner city Chicago in any films. Like I remember in this one film that came out a few years after this called A Family Affair by a. James Earl Jones and Robert Duvall, 
Robert Duvall is a good old boy from Arkansas. Learns he has a learns he's half black and has a black half brother who's a cop in Chicago. And they play like some blues songs when he's go, taking his journey up there and finally arrives in inner city Chicago. Yeah, and I feel like you know Chicago's got a lot of history with blues, jazz, and blues. It, it does. So maybe it's I feel like pretty fitting. It's you know? fitting. Yeah, it's intentional, intentionally connecting them. Yeah, yeah, but um. I think it just fits really well with the vibe too, because you know, you see like inner city Chicago. It's kind of you know run down, run down, yeah, that area, yeah, like where they were. And then like Pete goes to to knock on the door, and there's like all these like, all these chains and like yeah, gates and whatnot. Yeah, I forget the actress's name. Alfrey, Alfrey Woodward. Yeah, yeah, that's her name. Yeah, and she <laughs> she was like she's he's like he's like you know. Um, Mrs. McRae, uh, you know I'm a Catholic, right? And, he, and she goes, I'm not. I'm not. I just send him to school there because the nuns don't take no shit. <laughs> that was so funny. And I like how subtle she is, too, when she's talking about, she's really talking about what's about, what kind of benefits can she and her son get out of him going going to her, going to this school, to Western University. Yeah. She's like, I don't know much about basketball, but I know enough to know that a foul is not a foul if the ref, if the ref doesn't blow the whistle. Yeah, and he's like... He's like, Miss McRae, do you really want your son growing up and leading men, uh, you know, bending the rules? And she goes, what? Do you, wh-? And he goes, what do you think he's going to become? And she goes, a millionaire, a millionaire. <laughs> like she's question like like she's really like she really hopes for that. And she gets her wish. Yeah, she gets a nice house. And and even after the fact in the epilogue, when he goes to the NBA. Yeah, I don't you know, I to tell you the truth, I didn't really like Penny Hardaway's like character. I feel like he was like in the movie. He felt like he was kind of whining, right? Like he was like, home. I'm I'm homesick. I want to go home. Yeah. A, a lot of those athletes, they feel like a sense of entitlement, like like a Ricky Rose character is like, I'm a white blue chip selection, so I deserve this. Yeah. And then like, like Butch feels like he should be starting like, you know, as a freshman and, and Pete, Pete's like, uh, you'll get the opportunity to start, but you're, yeah. you know, you're not going to start. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if it was a team comprised of all freshmen, then you want to most likely one of them would be bound to start. Yeah. Yeah. And I just feel like the whole movie, he's just kind of like complaining. <laughs> he has, he does have that complaining factor to him. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, he, and then, then Butch is like, uh, you know, if, if I'm, if I was to leave school, would my mom be able to keep her house and job and, <laughs> he calls happy happy just loses it on the phone <laughs> like you do fucking deal with it yeah it's like it's your job to make him happy mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh and he's like he, he turns to butch and goes you better be at practice <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> but um yeah man this movie is this movie is so great and um it's an underrated sports film. it was very it had mixed reviews at the time it came out but it's like it was telling the truth about a lot of things in retrospect yeah and things it, but, that still go on especially that closing speech where like he just he just goes off on like on the reporters. He's like he's like you know he's like he's like uh, it's not much about so he's like this not it's not much about winning it's not a much much about education and it's not a much about basketball it's about money, money just goddamn money. Like I never thought I'd say these two words ever in front of anybody. I quit. Yeah, and then like his wife is like, oh my god, oh my god, he really did it. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's, it's just an epic movie, and I feel like it really captures what you know, the issues are in sports and paying athletes. and Yeah, I'm surprised this movie's not out on Blu-ray yet, neither. I mean, I had to, fi- I had to find the DVD for it. Yeah, it's 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 a very hard movie to find. Yeah, I mean, I found it on Amazon for like five bucks, brand new, but... Yeah. But, I, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just really surprised that it hasn't been translated to a higher definition format yet. Yeah, I, I feel like for basketball movies, it's definitely up there in my book. Like, I don't know any other ones. Like, I mean, there's the Ho- he, Hoosiers. Hoosiers is, is obviously. He got game. That's on Blu-ray. Well, it comes with a double, a double Spike Lee pack because I got the one with Twenty Fifth Hour and he got game. Gotcha. Uh, Love and basketball, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of any other ones that are really capture collegiate basketball, basketball, and like. The in college uh, setting, yeah, yeah, that are really accurate and true to form. Um, but this movie is definitely up there, and I definitely recommend it for anyone who who wants to watch a great basketball movie. Pick up this movie, definitely. I mean, if you like actors and you like college basketball, yeah, this movie's for you. Yeah, and there's so many. Like, I was just surprised when when I go back and look at it, like how many NBA cameos, like you know, actual basketball players are in the movie. They were actually able to get all these people in there. I was surprised about too, because before that, you just see them in like TV shows, like like this HBO series. I remember when I was a kid called First and Ten with OJ Simpson. It was basically like it was a rated R sports show, basically where they had a bunch of pro f- football athletes have been there. 
like entourage, like a predecessor to entourage, but with sports yeah. agents. Entourage are ballers. Speaking of sport, sports agents, in the movie, I forgot to mention this, uh, Robert Wool. Yeah, which is funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Arliss. Yeah, because then he would go on to Arliss. Uh-huh. But uh, and then he was also in uh, in Batman as well. The first Batman, yeah, plays a, I think a, like a reporter, re- reporter Alexander Knox. Yeah, so that was kind of cool seeing seeing Arliss in, it, in Blue Chips. It was yeah. In retrospect, it's, it's actually kind of prophetic. Yeah, yeah, it was it was good. Did you ever like get into that show or? Not really. No, no, no. I didn't get in, I didn't get into the show at the time it came out. I remember seeing the the uh, the previews for it when I used to watch HBO, but I never. At the time it came out, I was like, "This is past my bedtime." <laughs> so many great shows on HBO, man! Like, so many, so many. They're known. They, that's why they stay getting Grammys and Emmys and whatnot because of the kind of programming they come out with. I mean, Showtime. After them, Showtime is the only other premium channel where I ever watch their programming on a consistent basis. And then Cinemax, which HB, which HBO owns, I guess, right? They, I can only watch their movies. Their programming, it's like it's just a bunch of TNA flicks. Yeah, except yeah. for except for Banshee. Banshee was actually on point. Yeah, I, I saw a couple episodes of that show and really liked it. If you want to watch another good show like Banshee, that was on Cinemax. It's called Strike Back. I've, I've seen that. Yeah, it's awesome, man. It's like, dude, it's like Die Hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a British operative and a and a and a U.S. like special operative, and it's just <laughs> it's crazy, man. It's, it's like fun. Entourage and like Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> plenty, plenty of action. Plenty of. Plenty of funny dialogue, and it's like a British spinoff of a like this. The show was actually on the BBC, and oh, then yeah? they strike back, and then they spun it off in the US, kind of like uh, The Office. Oh yeah, but yeah. Uh, the, the, kind of the thing, similar fashion. Or shameless. But, uh, yeah, but it's really good. Um, but hey, man, thanks for doing this. This was awesome. Um, glad we got a chance to talk about this this film. I, I love it, and, and I definitely think it's you know, at the right time with college basketball, oh, and it is. March Madness coming up. Oh, it is definitely. I mean, you pick the right one during considering the time period and where we're at now. So yeah, like you said, it's fitting. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. I enjoy being here. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to the next episode. Oh, yes, we will have one. All right, man. Take care. You too. This podcast is available on my YouTube channel, Rotunes Reviews. It's also available on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and other major podcast distributors as well. So if you don't mind, please leave me some feedback. I'd really appreciate that. If you'd like to connect with me on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Rotunes Revs. I'm on Instagram, and I'm also on the Untapped app. My username is Brutuned. This is Andrew signing off. Cheers. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel and follow Roadtunes Reviews on Blogger, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And as always, thank you so much for your support.